thank you for watching Overcomers here on Turning Point. In appreciation of your viewership, Dr. Jeremiah would like to send you the Warrior's Prayer Bookmark, absolutely free. Contact Turning Point today. And now, from the Von Brown Center in Huntsville, Alabama, here is Dr. David Jeremiah with his message, Daniel, Overcoming the Lion's Den. Author and radio host Dr. Michael Brown has an interesting way of portraying the current state of our culture. In a recent book, he described a family who gathered around the television some years ago, and he wrote, It's been a beautiful spring day in the suburbs of Pennsylvania on this Thursday, June 7, 1961. You just got home from work. Your wife has almost finished preparing one of her typically delicious dinners. Tonight is TV night, and everyone is ready to enjoy Ozzy and Harriet and leave it to Beaver. Well, on this lovely spring night, you're a bit more tired than you realize and fighting to stay awake through the current Beaver episode. You doze off just before the end of the program, and when you wake up a few minutes later, everything has changed. The TV is still there, except it's a gigantic, flat, hanging-on-the-wall TV, exploding with colors. And instead of a smiling Cleaver family, it's something nobody should ever be watching on television, no matter when it is. It takes the man a few minutes to figure out how to use the remote control, but as he frantically changes from one channel to another, he's horrified at what's on the screen. His eyes can't believe what he's seeing. Then he looks around at his children, and he hardly recognizes them or the world that they're in. As he begins to comprehend the moral threats facing his family, he sees what is happening in their schools, among their friends, in the video games, and with the engulfing waves of depression and suicide washing over their generation like a toxic wave. The man feels like he's in a nightmare. He's gripped with fear at the moral and psychological struggles overtaking his personal world. Then suddenly, wrote Brown, you wake up with a start. This was all a dream, a very terrible dream, an absolute nightmare. With relief, you look around at your wonderful family, smiling at their dad who fell asleep in the middle of TV night, and you think to yourself, thank God this was only a bad dream. There's no way America or my family could ever look like that. And yet it does. People of my generation have watched the nightmare become a reality. Today's young people don't know anything except this present age. They don't know anything about Ozzy and Harriet. What they know is the walking dead. They don't remember a time when the Lord's Prayer was spoken at a public event. They don't realize the tremendous vortex into which our nation and world has descended. So they're growing up, even the young people in our churches, with a different perspective than other generations. The world of today is all they know. It's a world of secularism. And before I discourage you further, let me remind you that all of the characters of the Bible that we have been able to study lived in corrupt and degenerate times. We're not the only generation to ever face the challenges we face. The only two people in history who didn't live in a fallen culture were Adam and Eve, and they didn't live there for long because they messed it up. Every hero of Scripture had to grapple with a corrupt and evil society, and that includes the man Daniel. It seems to me we're living in times that remarkably resemble the days of Daniel, and the prophet Daniel is one of our best mentors for navigating the current age and learning to become overcomers. We're apt to be intimidated by our culture, at least sometimes I feel that way. Our schools and media and professors and celebrities and government agency and all the Hollywood mess, all the elements of our society are tolerant of most everything and anything except if you happen to be a biblical Christian. So if we're not careful, we'll keep our heads down, we'll keep our mouths shut, and our convictions will be silent. And the world likes to practice censorship when it comes to biblical truth, and that can put us on the defensive. 
careful study of the life of Daniel shows us how to overcome the intimidation of a corrupt culture. Daniel lived out his life in a situation not unlike our own. He was a godly man trying to live in a pagan culture. To say he overcame is understated. He lived in that culture from the time he was 14 years old until he died in his 90s. When he faced the cultural issues of his day that were in opposition to his faith, he overcame with courage and conviction. And men and women, I believe that this is God's challenge to all of us to overcome. We don't have to shout and make fools of ourselves, but like this man of God in the Old Testament, we do have to be overcomers. There are many places where we could enter into Daniel's life, and obviously I can't teach his whole life in the time that we have tonight. But I've chosen for our time together here in Huntsville the sixth chapter of Daniel and the story of Daniel's encounter with King Darius and his lions. As the story begins, Daniel has been out of the mainstream of political power since Babylon was defeated by Medo-Persia. Now, after two years have passed, and at the young age of 83, he is summoned by Darius, the Medo-Persian king, and given a very prestigious assignment in the new administration. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 reads like this, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The first thing we learn about overcomers from Daniel is that overcomers are promoted. It is 538 B.C., and King Darius is establishing a great world empire. Unlike Babylon, this is not a monarchy he has defeated. This is something totally different. This government is going to be set under the leadership of 120 men. He calls them satraps, and apparently a part of their responsibility was to collect taxes for the king. And because there was dishonesty among these lower-level officials, King Darius selected three men to be governors. And the scripture says it this way, so that the king would suffer no loss, because he was getting ripped off by his satraps. Of these three governors, Daniel was the most impressive. And Darius selected him to function kind of like as the leader of all of the rest. According to the description in Daniel 6, Daniel was preferred above all the other governors and satraps because, quote, there was an excellent spirit in him. That's what the scripture says. This means that he had a good attitude, that he worked hard, he fulfilled his responsibility, he was honest, he didn't complain, he just did what he was supposed to do. Daniel had continued to honor God with his life, and now God is going to honor Daniel again. Daniel would become the second in command over all the Medo-Persian Empire, a fact that did not go unnoticed by his peers. This did not make him a popular person. And the second thing we learn about overcomers from Daniel is that overcomers are often persecuted. If you're going to overcome, if you're going to be victorious, if you're going to be more than a conqueror, if you're going to stand above the heap, people are going to shoot at you and criticize you and persecute you. Daniel 6, 4 says that the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel. In other words, we shouldn't have too much trouble understanding this in this current environment. They were going to try to look up some nasty stuff on him that would disqualify him from office. They weren't happy about his promotion, and at the core of their hatred was their intense jealousy of his position in the kingdom. He had risen above them and was about to become their superior. If Darius's appointment was carried out, Daniel would have power over all the governors and administrators. So they determined to get Daniel out of their way. It's so interesting how contemporary the Bible is and how so many of the stories we have to live with every day aren't very much different than the stories we read about in the Old Testament. 
They hoped to catch him committing some trespass he could be indicted for. But they couldn't find anything to hold against him. This is before Internet. (laughs) And the more they searched, the angrier they became. The hatred of these men grew, for envy always hates the excellency that it cannot reach. The final conclusion of his adversaries after their exhaustive scrutiny is summarized in Daniel 6, 5. It says, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Unable to find any legal way to stop the appointment of Daniel, his adversaries came up with a plot to take him down, and they made up a story. Can you believe it? (laughs) All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, The counselors and advisors consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, will be cast into the den of lions. Now they have set Daniel up for failure because they know that no matter what happens, Daniel is going to pray every day like Daniel prayed every day. His enemies assembled together before the king, and they proposed this new law. Anyone who prayed to any god beside Darius for 30 days would be put to death in the lion's den. And there was a lie in their proposal. Not all the officials had consulted together, because Daniel was one of the officials, and he didn't get invited to the meeting. And once they made up their story, they went before King Darius, and playing on his ego, They presented it to him and urged him to sign the document. Verse 8, and they said, Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. In effect, this proposal would make Darius God for a month. He has to be worshipped for 30 days exclusively. These leaders did what they could to get the king to sign the edict, which according to law could not be revoked once it was put in place. The king was considered infallible. And once he put a law on the books, not even he could rescind it. And in a moment he would come to regret Darius signed the law. We all know about this because even in our jargon today, when we say something, we say, oh, it's the law of the Medes and Persians. What does that mean? You can't mess with it. You can't change it. It's a done deal. I remember reading about Hall of Fame NFL coach Tony Dungy, who gave an interview in which he stated his belief that God gave him a new primetime television job so he could help Christian athletes have the boldness to share their faith. Prior to Super Bowl 52, Philadelphia quarterback Nick Foles told Dungy that God had put him on the Philadelphia Eagles team for a reason. He had been the backup quarterback, but he was the starting quarterback in the Super Bowl, and he felt confident he was going to have a good game because God had placed him there for a purpose. When Dungy reported on that conversation, the pushback from atheists and critics and secularists was immediate. But Dungy was unapologetic. I feel like that's one of the reasons God has me at NBC, he said, to be the voice of some of these Christian athletes who want to say these things. Dungy continued, I think people have to understand that Christian athletes have the same ability to espouse their views as anyone else. And if we ask them a question about what is allowing them to play well, and they say, well, it's my faith in Christ or it's the Holy Spirit, we can't hold that in and we can't begrudge them of that. Later he wrote, I'm just thankful for the boldness of Coach Peterson and those Eagle players to express their faith. I was proud to be able to use my job where God placed me to help their voice be heard. What he was saying, though, is this. You speak up for God. You stand up for God. You stand alone for God. You are going to get shot at, and you are going to be persecuted. And if you happen to work in the media, God help you, because it is brutal and it is unforgiving. If you are an overcomer, if you live above the pack, if you walk in a way that says, You are more than a conqueror. You get promoted, all right. In fact, it seems like Daniel got promoted no matter what he did. He was like Joseph. Have you ever studied the life of Joseph? When Joseph got thrown into the pit and then was taken to Potiphar's house, 
The Bible says after he was there, Potiphar put him in charge of his house, and he didn't even know what he was doing. He said, just do whatever you want to do. And then he got out of Potiphar's house, and he went to prison. You know the stuff that happened with Potiphar's wife, and, and Joseph's in prison now. You know what the Scripture says? And the prison keeper came to Joseph and said, I want you to run the prison for me. So Joseph's now running the prison. And then he goes back and he ends up in the palace with the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh looks at him and he says, you know, you're a pretty good dude. Why don't you run this whole country for me? <laughs> so whether he was in the pit or the prison or Pharaoh's house or Potiphar's house, wherever he went, the Bible says, the Lord blessed him because of the person that he was. And that's what we need to ask God to help us become. No matter where we go or what the situation is, if we're God's people, if we're people like Daniel in whom there is a good spirit, God will use us. He'll promote us. But don't get caught up in your promotion because you also get persecuted. <laughs> Third thing is overcomers are persistent. I love this about Daniel. Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 6 says, When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God, as it was his custom since early days. Now, I've heard preachers preach on this and say when Daniel was told he couldn't pray, he went home, and he flung open his windows, and he prayed as loud as he could to put it in the face of everybody that he was a man of God. And that's not what it says. It says he went home, just like he always did, went and prayed, just like he always did. It says, as it was his custom since early days. When he discovered the law had been signed by Darius, he didn't do anything different. He just did the thing he always did. His daily habit for years had been to pray to God toward Jerusalem three times every day. And that's exactly what he did the day he learned of the new law. Daniel was faithful and fearless without regard to the consequences. He was an overcomer. He was consistent. He was consistent in his professional life as recognized by the king. He was consistent in his personal life. His detractors couldn't find anything to accuse him of. And he was consistent in his prayer life. Overcomers are consistent. They're persistent. They just get up every day and do the things that need to be done. They don't take a day off. And Daniel was that kind of a person. He was a persistent man. But now comes the good stuff. He was also protected. Verses 12 through 23 tell us that the Lord didn't prevent Daniel from being thrown into the lion's den. He could have. But through all the events that transpired, we see God's hand of protection over Daniel's life. Let me tell you what I've learned, men and women. When you walk with God, God walks with you. He never turns his back on you. He never leaves you. Even when you think you're in the most difficult situation, if you just hold in for a moment, you'll see God. He'll show up. And somebody once told me, when God shows up, he likes to show off. And when he shows off, he takes care of your problems and puts things right. So the first thing that Daniel was protected from was from the law. Notice Daniel 6, 13 through 15. They answered and said before the king, Daniel does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but he makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him, and then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. By this time in the story, King Darius was furious at himself. He realized he had been had. He'd been backed in a corner. He'd done something he really didn't want to do. His conscience was tormenting him. He knew the danger he had put Daniel in by signing into law this preposterous 30-day prayer ban. So he worked all day trying to find a loophole in the law. He knew if he couldn't find one, he'd have to sentence Daniel to death. Persian law dictated that sentences for crimes were to be carried out on the day the crime was committed. The lower the sun set in the horizon, the louder Darius's conscience became. 
screaming at him to find a solution that would save this man who could save his kingdom from corruption. And he was protected from the lions. We know this story. I remember this story on flannel graph. Do you know what that is? All of my Sunday school teachers, I've seen every lion flannel graph has ever produced. I want you to know that. The Bible says the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now, one writer that I read helps us understand what Daniel's first night in the lion's den must have been like. Listen up. As the guards closed the aperture and went their way, Daniel slid gradually to the floor of the den. The big lions that had come bounding from their cabins at the inflow of light all stopped suddenly short as a steed reined up by a powerful hand on the bridle. The initial roars died away as they formed a solid phalanx and looked toward this man who stood in their den in easy reach. There was some snorting and a little whining, and some of them turned around and went back into their caverns. Others of the great beast yawned and lay down on the floor, but not one made a move toward their visitor. Thanks be unto Jehovah, breathed the prophet. He hath stopped the mouths of these fierce beasts, that they will do me no harm. And he sat down on the floor and leaned his back against the wall to make himself comfortable for the night. There's a little imagination here. Soon, two cub lions moved in his direction, not stealthily or crouching as though to make an attack, but in obvious friendliness, and one lay on each side of Daniel as though to give him warmth and protection in the chilly dungeon. Their mother, an old lioness, crept over and lay in front of the prophet. He gently stroked their backs as they each turned their heads and licked his hand. Enclosed by the lioness and her cubs, the head of the patriarch was gradually pillowed on the back of one of the cubs as the four slept soundly in perfect peace and tranquility. Wow, that must have been quite a night, and I'm sure it wasn't too different than that. Uh, there are a lot of people that are familiar with the painting of Daniel standing in the lion's den, his back to the lions in quiet contemplation, hands behind his back. The lions are arranged in a semicircle around him, some standing still, others padding back and forth. And the expression on the lion's face is a mixture of perplexity and awe. Here is a meal standing in front of them, but they are somehow restrained from attacking, as if an invisible shield is keeping them from moving toward Daniel. And while Daniel was sleeping in the lion's den, Darius couldn't sleep. The king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He put Daniel in the lion's den, and Daniel went to sleep on one of the lions, and Darius went back to the palace, and he couldn't get one wink. And while Daniel slept like a lamb, even though he was being watched over by lions, Darius tossed and turned. He didn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He was counting the minutes until sunrise when he would discover Daniel's fate. He was probably asking himself over and over, why did I agree to play the role of a god for 30 days? What was I thinking? His vanity and weak will cost him his supper and his sleep. Listen to this. The lions wanted to eat but couldn't. The king could eat but wouldn't. It was a unique night in Persia. <laughs> And he was protected not only from the law and from the lions, but he was protected by the Lord. Listen to the rest of this story, verses 19 and 20. The king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And it must have seemed like an eternity before he heard the answer. When Darius cast Daniel into the lion's den, he told Daniel that he had faith that Daniel would survive. But let me ask you a question. If you have faith that man's going to survive, why are you staying awake all night, right? I don't think his faith was very strong. Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you, he said. Remember that? But the king's faith wasn't strong. 
And not only was the king uncertain of God's will, he wasn't even sure God could save Daniel from the lions if he wanted to. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. The famed London preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon observed that it was a good thing the lions didn't try to eat Daniel because they would not have enjoyed him. He was half grit and the other half backbone. <laughs> so why did God save Daniel from death? Verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. God sent his angel to protect Daniel because Daniel was found innocent before God and the king. And the miraculous act vindicated Daniel and displayed God's power before this pagan leader. The king was exceeding glad for him, says the scripture, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him. The Bible vividly portrays the king's delight in Daniel's survival. The Bible says he checked him over to be sure he was unharmed. Like Daniel's friends who had escaped the furnace unscathed, Daniel came out completely uninjured. And when we see how ferocious the lions were with the people who were thrown into the den the next day, it's pretty obvious that Daniel was able to escape without a scratch only because there was an intervention by God. And the last phrase of verse 23 is the most important phrase in the story tonight. Because he believed in his God. Ladies and gentlemen, do we believe in our God? When we go through our problems, do we believe in our God? When we're thrown into our lion's den and it looks like it's the end and there's no hope, can we still believe in God? Do we have the overcomer spirit that says we are more than conquerors and no matter what comes against us, no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what we face from day to day, we stand in power and in strength because the Lord our God fights for us and he is our champion and in him we are more than conquerors. For Daniel and his three friends, faith was a commitment to omnipotence, not a commitment to outcome. As the three friends said before they were thrown into the fiery furnace, they said, whether he chooses or not, in either case, we're going to trust him. We aren't going to trust him because we know what he's going to do. We're going to trust him because of who he is. A Sunday school teacher once asked her class why Daniel wasn't afraid when he was thrown into the lion's den. And one little girl said, because the lion of the tribe of Judah was in there with him. Now, that's pretty good theology right there. <laughs> Overcomers are promoted and persecuted and persistent. We all got all of these. We know what this is about, and they're protected, but overcomers are powerful. Watch this. The king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. If you watch our television program, you know that we always have some dramatic beginnings for each program. And we have done some pretty wild and crazy things, if you want to know the truth. When I was teaching on Daniel several years ago, our guys came and told me that we were going to have a shoot at our headquarters and that we were going to reenact Daniel in the lion's den and that we were going to have real lions. They had found some place up in Hollywood where you could rent lions. <laughs> and they brought them to where I work. <laughs> and they told me at a certain time they wanted me to come down and meet them. <laughs> Don and I looked at each other. We said, I guess it's going to be all right. They surely wouldn't bring us down there if they weren't safe. And we went down there kind of not feeling all that confident about life. And uh, they had two live lions for our production. This is not going to work, I told our guys. We don't have enough lions. 
when the lions consumed the men, their families, and it lists all the people in the families, that were thrown in after Daniel was taken out, that they consumed them all before they hit the floor of the lion's den. And there ain't no two lions that can pull that off. <laughs> they said, don't worry, Pastor. We will shoot these lions multiple times, and when they come on television, we'll have all the lions we need. And sure enough, that's what they did. Those two lions were multiplied electronically over and over and over until it looked like we had enough lions to take down anybody that got in their way. Someone has said the lions got their reward. Instead of one tough old Jew, they devoured for breakfast the spineless men who had accused Daniel, and they devoured them before they hit the ground. Amen. Dr. C.I. Schofield, who was the editor of the famed Schofield Bible, was a brilliant lawyer whose career was marred by alcoholism till he was converted to Christ at the age of 36. He went on to become a great Bible student, pastor and evangelist, and a missionary advocate. One time he gave this testimony based on the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Here's what he said. Shortly after I was saved, I passed the window of a store in St. Louis where I saw a painting of Daniel in the lion's den. That great man of faith with his hands behind his back and those beasts circling him was looking up, and as I stood there, great hope flooded my heart. Only a few days had passed since I, a drunken lawyer, had been converted, and no one had yet told me anything about the keeping power of Jesus Christ. I thought to myself, there are lions all about me too, like my old habits and sins, but the one who shut the lion's mouth for Daniel can shut them for me too. I know that I could not win the battle in my own strength, and the painting made me realize that while I was weak and helpless, my God was strong and able. He had saved me, and now he would deliver me from the wild beasts in my life. Oh, what a rest of spirit that painting brought to me. And I came here tonight, men and women, to tell you that the God you serve is an overcoming God. There aren't any lions in your life that he is incapable of defeating. There aren't any wild beasts that you face, whether it's in your temperament, in your background, in your situation at home, that is too much for God. He is able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. Let me tell you, if God can shut the mouths of hungry lions and preserve his prophet, which we know he did, he's capable of caring for every need that you have. And if you came here tonight kind of overwhelmed with life, and you don't feel like an overcomer, but you feel like you're down under the circumstances, I came here to tell you that the God we celebrate in these events is your God. If you've trusted him as your personal Savior, he's here for you. He wants to help you, but you have to cooperate with him. You don't get to call the shots. You don't get to go and say, God, I want you to help me, and here's how I want you to do it. You go to God and say, Lord God, I need you. You show me what to do, and I will do it. And if you will do that, God will give you the direction you need for your life. He will show you the next step. He will take you to the next place. He will help you go back and fix the things that are wrong and build on those things for a future that brings glory to his name. And if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ who has the power to come out of the grave victorious over death is the Jesus Christ who wants to give you victory in your life. The Bible says that because he lives, we also can live. That means that if I put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior, I can live. I can have eternal life. And I don't have to ask, is that true? I have millions of experiences over these 50 years of ministry watching God do that. Tonight when I came to this place, a couple came to the back to see me. This man is a doctor, and uh, I met him when I was the pastor of the church in Fort Wayne. I don't know if I have this story exactly right, but I remember it like this. One day, he came to church with his son, and on the way home, his son said to him something about, Daddy, where do we get the book they study? He didn't have a Bible. And they didn't have a Bible in the house. 
And I think the next week he called my office and we directed him to a Christian bookstore and he went and bought a Bible. A few days later, I was in his house. He reminded me tonight that when I was in his house, I told him when I was sharing the gospel with him that I wasn't going to leave until he got it right. I don't remember all that, but that sounds like the brashness that was pretty true of me back in those days. Well, to make a long story short, that doctor became a Christian and his wife became a Christian. When I got cancer 20 years ago, I didn't know what to do. I had not ever had any thoughts that I would ever get cancer. And I was with my friend, Dr. Ken Nichols, and I said, I'm going to call, I'm going to call Ken Castor and ask him what to do. He helped me. He walked me through that, helped me get into the Mayo Clinic until I found my way back to San Diego and the help that I needed. Tonight, when he came to see me, he gave me a book. The book was written by his son, who is a youth pastor now. And I guess this tells you, I guess this tells you how old I am. His son's son has now enrolled in a Christian college because he wants to go into the ministry as well. Listen to me, friends. I told, I told the people in the back room, when God saves a person, he doesn't just save the person. He saves their family. He saves their generations. He saves their children and their grandchildren. And oftentimes you think, oh, I just led one person to Christ. But you revisit the story 50 years later, and you walk away with a book like I will cherish when I go home tonight. And I want to tell you what God did for him that night in his house. He wants to do for you. He wants to change your life. Can God change your life? Yes, he can. He changed that man's life. And they told me tonight a little bit more about what's happened. Listen to me. God wants to do 